Well, Gladys, thank you so much for indulging us. <laughs> that was uh, fabulous. And I have to say, your um, sort of focus on getting it done, letting the facts speak for themselves and sense of accountability certainly uh, came through in your address. So thank you very much. And as someone who has experienced Service New South Wales uh, recently, that's been a significant upgrade as well. So congratulations. And I know Mike Pratt's also in the audience who uh, has also been very involved in that. So that's uh, fantastic. Now, I have got lots of questions, but I know that it's not about me. Um, but probably just to get the ball rolling and then if anyone has got a question, please um, put your hand up. The microphone will come to you and uh, let, let Gladys know uh, who you are and where you're from. Uh, so to get the ball rolling, um, when, when you started as Premier, you talked about um, the 12 Premier priorities, which I really like. Once again, back to that sense of accountability. So I'm interested, as you reflect now coming to the end of Term 1, what priority out of the 12 you feel most proud about and what one you think there's more, more to be done? Um, I, I can't really say which one I feel most proud about. And I also want to commend my predecessor, Mike Baird, for really having the notion that a Premier should have priorities and you've got to deliver against them. But what I say to my team is it's really exciting to know that governments can do things horizontally. And that's what the Premier's priorities are all about. Because traditionally, each department worked in a silo. But now with the advent of better data collection, now with the advent of technology, we can actually make sure that we're providing a whole of government response to key issues. Mm. And the thing that scares me about the Premier's priorities, I always say this to my team, is what's not on the list. Because everything on the list gets done. Because every single person who works with us together, uh, every single person in every department knows what the priorities are and they know that that's a focus for the government and it gives very much clarity and everybody feels motivated because we're all working towards the same goals. Mm. So the challenge I put to the team is I've got my ideas about what the next round of priorities should be, what do you think they are? And nothing gives you more satisfaction than ticking something off and saying this priority has been satisfied but you can't stop there. What I say to my um, to the team is once you get to the target or near the target, that, that then should become the modus operandi. That should become, you know, business as usual. It's not about taking your foot off the pedal and, and forgetting that one and going on to a new one. But it's about saying we've reached our target of what has been a challenge for us and a challenge for a long time and now we can actually look at the next thing and now we can make this business as usual. And one couple of examples I'll give you is um, we were looking at literacy and numeracy results across a whole range of sc public schools and we found uh, some schools were doing better than they should in terms of the result, which is fantastic. We found, obviously, depending on the socio-demographic, some schools doing really well and then there was, you know, a large chunk in the middle who were underperforming. And we looked at what they, those reasons were and addressed them and we have a program called Bump It Up and now the kids in those schools get individualised care and those results have gone through the roof. And I really want to thank everybody involved in all of the Premier's priorities, not just the people that work in the public service but all the teachers and nurses and doctors who actually have valued the peer support because rather than um, be becoming something to be scared of, everybody is, is saying, well, how did you get this result? You know, share that information. Mm. And that's amazing. And uh, that the culture that's being developed is really positive. Again, it's one of col collaboration. And, um, and fingers crossed, if we get the chance to keep going, there's a whole range of other priorities that um, I've already got identified which I'd like to tackle into the future. But one thing I should say that I'm perhaps proudest of, you did ask me to, to single one out, was, um, and Minister Goward deserves a lot of credit for this as well, but in New South Wales for decades, the trend of children living in out-of-home care was increasing. So for whatever reason, children did not have a safe environment in which they were growing up and were removed from their families, we've re reduced that trend. And so that trend is the numbers are going down. So the way we've done that is by actually supporting preventive measures and supporting families stay together and giving them what they need so they can provide a safe environment for their children. And so that's a social challenge that had dogged us for so many decades. We're not out of the woods yet, but the fact that the trend is changing and the numbers of, of children or the proportion of children having to be taken from their families is reducing gives us a great sense of satisfaction and we know we're on the right track. Mm. A real meaningful difference. Mm. I'll open it up for questions. So, ah, there we are.
Tony Toomer from First State Super. Um, thanks for a great presentation. I guess um, from my perspective, the achievements are pretty significant um, and lots and lots of growth there, which is wonderful for our state. Um, with that, obviously, comes challenges around sustainability and the impact on communities. I guess what I'd be interested in uh, understanding is going forward um, with all that growth, what lessons have been learned and what can we expect to see differently? No, great question. Um, and a couple of things we've done to make sure communities um, do not feel concerned about perhaps growth and the changes that are happening around them is firstly, um, we have invested um, hundreds of millions of dollars in an open space policy. So now the government can look at opportunities of acquiring land which we might not own or converting land we do own into public space. For the first time in our state's history, we have a tree canopy measure because we know that when you have greenery, not only is it aesthetically pleasing, it's better for your health, it's better for the environment, and for Western Sydney, it reduces the temperature by a couple of degrees and reduces the need to use air conditioners, for example. So um, we are doing everything we can to make our suburbs more livable because you want your own environment to be um, a happy place to be. So public investing in public space, um, proactively making our suburbs greener, ensuring we protect our heritage, but also, most importantly, putting in that social infrastructure. So before we came to government, you'd, have, you'd see a lot of growth without the schools and the hospitals. And that's why we've put so much effort into really investing in that social infrastructure. But also, uh, for Greater Sydney in particular, because in the regions, the regions crave growth. The regions want to grow. They want people to not just stay there but move there. And so their proposition is very different. And in Greater Sydney, the work that the Greater Sydney Commission has done has been outstanding. They've been an external independent advisor to government on how we should plan. And the three cities plan, which I uh, perhaps rushed through in terms of our vision for Greater Sydney, was really part of the, the work that they did. And they informed that, that decision making for us. And, but it's a clear, clear vision. And now when we're planning for transport projects, we know that we need to improve connectivity between those cities and in terms of Sydney and the regions as well. But rest assured that we're extremely mindful of the proposition that people don't want to change the local character of their communities and you have to balance that up with the need to provide more housing and the need to provide schools and hospitals. But we, through our open spaces policy, through our canopy policy, through um, making sure that we make our cities as livable as possible, uh, I hope we're addressing those concerns. Mm. Next question. Gentleman over there. Uh, Emmanuel Alfieras, uh, Premier, thank you uh, for today. Um, earlier this morning we heard about uh, a started federation reform that started a couple of years ago and then went flat. Do you have a view about federation reform going forward and what role New South Wales can play? Oh, I do. I think we need to, and I've been very public about this, um, I think we need to modernise the financial state relations between the Commonwealth and the states. If you, uh, without, again, I say this as a statement of fact, but when the federation was formed, there was very little difference between the colonies in terms of population, size, economies. But now you can't really implement the same policy in New South Wales and Victoria as you might do in Tasmania or South Australia. And I think we have to modernise the way in which we operate. One of the key reforms that I'm pushing, which the other states are agreeing to and the Commonwealth has as well, is to reduce the number of formal agreements we have with each other. There are currently 43 agreements between New South Wales and the Commonwealth Government. In an ideal world, you might have one where there's an allocation of funding per every year or, or over a period of years uh, and perhaps more freedom for New South Wales and other states um, to potentially raise their own revenue. So I'd love to be able to abolish stamp duty and land tax and all those things, but I can't until we have those conversations. So I'm always optimistic about the future. And it's not as though the current system isn't serving us well, but I'm always someone that wants to not miss the opportunities that reform could present. And states need an incentive to be efficient. And it really pains me, no disrespect to our Queensland cousins, but um, how can I say this without being offensive? They could be managing their budget more efficiently, but I have to subsidise them by the tune of $17 billion for GST. Right? So they can take the easy decisions and increase the size of their public service or do this and that, which would be a very easy political life to have. But is it making the state more efficient? Is it really progressing them to the next stage? Is it getting rid of their debt? 
So I think we need a system which incentivises states to provide better services for their citizens, but also be more efficient. And otherwise, we'll just continue to repeat the inefficient, get rewarded for inefficiencies, because then asking for, I, w I never want to ask for a handout, I never need to, because New South Wales is resilient. We stand on our own. And I always appreciate the larger states have to subsidise the smaller states, and that will always continue. That's part of our ethos. But not, not subsidising inefficiency, I think that's not fair. But that's just one example. I could go on for a long time. But I think there's lots of opportunities for us to modernise the Federation, create incentives, and reduce the red tape with all due respect. When you have 43 agreements between the state and the Commonwealth, that's, that's 43 times six sets of bureaucrats, with all due respect, um, and, for example, we should have one health agreement, one education agreement, not multiple agreements within each sector. That's the ideal. And I think that's something we should aim towards as the next step in modern... I call it dynamic federalism. I even presented a paper on it. Anyway, I better stop because I could go on for hours about this. <laughs> Clearly a passion. <laughs> next question. It's easier than question time. It's great. <laughs> Gentleman over there. Sorry to ask my second question of the day, but it's too good an opportunity. Doug Ferguson, KPMG Premier. Um, earlier on today, uh, we were talking about a, a problem with Australians being increasingly desensitised to good news and being um, more reactive to bad news. And I think what you have set out here this afternoon with us um, is a refreshingly factual account of your progress and your government's progress and also your vision for the future. So I commend you on that. Uh, my question is, um, what is your policy vision for supercharging shared community growth for regional New South Wales? Uh, well, regional New South Wales currently is, is very challenged by the drought. Um, I don't think people realise 99% of our state is in drought. Notwithstanding those conditions, and they are very difficult and stressful conditions, and depending on which part of the state you go to, there's varying degrees of how desperate the situation is. Um, we've had extremely positive jobs growth, business investments gone through the roof in our regions. And notwithstanding the challenges of the drought, uh, the way that we're investing in infrastructure, the cranes in the sky you see in Sydney are replicated in the bush. So you go to Dubbo and you see a huge crane in the sky and you think, gosh, that's the hospital getting built. Or you go somewhere else and you see a major road project and the employment that's providing communities is amazing. Um, and we've now mandated that a certain percentage of jobs on every regional rural project, in fact every project, has to have a certain percentage of apprenticeships, a certain percentage of Indigenous Australians and the rate of employment in, in various communities has gone through the roof. So the opportunities to improve connectivity and also to address water security issues are ours and we have a once in a generation opportunity because we have the capital to do it to really make that difference. And I remember two years ago, we took the decision to build a pipeline from the Murray River to Broken Hill to provide water to a city of 20,000 odd people who previously relied on water from the Mindy Lakes. At the time, we were criticised for it. And look at it now, it's about to be switched on. So that took guts at the time and I remember getting criticised for spending half a billion dollars on that pipeline. But what would we have done to provide water security for 20,000 people had we not made that investment? Now that's just one small example of what good planning does but it also gives the regions confidence because if a government's investing in basic infrastructure, that's great. But we're also making a point of investing in conservatoriums, sporting facilities, things that allow families, attract professionals, attract tradies, attract people of all walks of life to build their lives in regional New South Wales and have that investment there. Because when you build the basics, it's one thing, but when you provide sporting facilities, um, arts and cultural investment, it shows that township, that region, that you have faith in their future. That you're not just tokenistically saying you'll be right. You're actually saying we want you to grow and prosper. And the next challenge for us, and the, the Deputy Premier and I also established a half a billion dollar fund to say to businesses, you know, can I be frank, not so much picking winners, but I'd much rather say to business, we'll provide the roads 
infrastructure or the utilities, you just come and set up shop. We'll make it easy for you. And we've seen success through that half a billion dollar fund and, and I think into the future we'll be able to do that again on a larger scale because we are seeing brands um, come to the regions which previously they wouldn't. So um, I'll just make this last point. About six months ago, we established for the first time a very detailed 20-year vision for growth in our regions. I feel passionately about this because I think New South Wales will benefit, as will the regions. And, um, and uh, I don't want there to be any divide between the city and the regions, quite the opposite. We, we want to narrow that by providing that investment, that jobs growth. And we know, as you do in the city, but in the bush it's exacerbated. If, you're, if you provide confidence to a township by building a new piece of infrastructure, the business community follows because they then build on that confidence. They create the jobs. And again, with all due respect, when we talk jobs creation in New South Wales, it's private sector jobs that are sustainable, market-driven. They're not jobs which aren't productive and, and that's what we want to continue to do in our regions. Okay, I hope I've answered that question. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Next question. Cool. Ooh. Oh, there's one. There we go. Thanks, Helen. Do you want to use <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Premier. Uh, Alan Mills from Deloitte. Um, so I'm a beneficiary of the Active Kids and the Creative Kids program, which is awesome. Can you share anything about sort of building on that program in the future? Sure. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, we have an Active Kids program and a Creative Kids program. So when I talked about Service New South Wales and some of the cost of living programs we have, one of the Premier's priorities is to reduce obesity in young people and in the population. And of course, cost of living is always uh, an issue that's top of mind for government. So we had this idea in the last year's budget to provide what we call an active kids voucher. So if your child of school age between five and 18 engages in a sporting activity outside of school, you get a $100 voucher to support each child in that activity. And uh, it's been amazing. We've already had a million people take that up. So a million, sorry, I should say a million vouchers. So some families obviously have two and three kids. But in the last eight or nine months, we've had a million vouchers redeemed, which is fantastic. It's less than we budgeted for. There's 1.2 million children in New South Wales. So I'm saying to everybody, redeem your vouchers because it means your kids are playing something outside of school. They're not inside looking at their computers or their handhelds. They're actually out there doing physical activity. The sporting groups, this is one thing we hadn't anticipated. The sporting groups are also seeing a huge nut, nut jump in their membership. And they're excited because they're getting scale to do things, invest in equipment and do all that stuff. And the way the sporting organisations. We've had thousands of sporting organisations sign up to the program and proactively support parents in getting these vouchers. And then we thought, well, Active Kids is working so well, we'll double it. So now you get two $100 vouchers per child. And we want to encourage people to, or kids to play sport all year round. So hopefully you can redeem one in the summer and one in the winter so that the kids are active all year. And for some families it's a nice to have but for some families and this warms my heart more than anything is when a grandparent came up to me once and said well my granddaughter plays netball now for the first time because she's one of three kids and if you you know if you're struggling uh, and you get an extra three hundred dollars to support your kids in playing sport well that makes a difference for a lot of families and the creative kids is a new concept we've had which is also getting good take up it hasn't been around as long as the active kids but creative kids means uh, a similar voucher hundred dollar voucher to support your child having a music lesson a drama lesson coding anything they want out of school not everybody i wasn't a very sporty child i tried but i wasn't very sporty um but you know had 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 there been opportunities to participate in something creative out of school my parents may have taken that up so in any event uh, we're trying to do everything we can to encourage participation to provide support but again, this isn't. This wouldn't be possible unless we'd we'd worked our guts out to um, build our strong budget. And um, that they're two of the forty, more than forty programs now we have across government uh, on cost of living. And there's lots of other things we're doing for seniors as well, and other categories of, of of people. So essentially, no matter what your circumstances, I always say to people, no matter what your circumstances, the savings are there to be had. And um, I encourage you all to engage with Service New South Wales. <laughs> Fabulous. I think we've got time for one last question. So the, got the microphone. The 
Good afternoon, uh, Gladys. Thank you for that wonderful presentation today. It's very heartening to see all the great things that you're doing for the state. I'm Louise Clunis Ross from Asian Business, and I'd just like to un understand what your plans for international engagement is for the state, and also in particular with Asia as well. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Wonderful question. Our international engagement is absolutely critical, and um, especially in the Asian region. Um, firstly, um, again, no disrespect to my southern colleagues in, in Victoria, but when I compare New South Wales, I don't want to compare Sydney or New South Wales to the other states in Australia, but I see our greatest competition to be Hong Kong and Singapore and other places. We need to look at how we can lift ourselves as a regional player. Um, when it comes to financial services, we have the best brands here. People see us as a gateway to Asia irrespective of which part of Asia or the rest of the world they're from. And that's a positive brand for us. And so we're seeing the rate of increase in financial services investment huge. Uh, and um, and Barangaroo has become a bit of a precinct, a bit of a hub for that. It's really interesting to see how that's developing. But similarly, the second airport at Badgeries offers us immeasurable opportunities because um, a, a small Asian city might be four or five million people and a direct flight to a small Asian city gives us new markets which we hadn't previously explored. So you could be getting your, your produce uh, from Badgeries Creek to a small Asian city, direct flight, which nobody else is going to, is enormous opportunities for New South Wales. But I think it's two ways. I rely on lots of global brands, local brands, investing in our infrastructure projects. We can't do our, build our projects on our own. We rely on expertise. We rely on um, ingenuity and manufacturing to support us in developing, developing our huge infrastructure pipeline. Uh, but similarly, we are now exporting education services, exporting lots of other service-based uh, industries to Asia. But there is a huge demand for fresh produce from New South Wales in both um, places like China and India, emerging markets in India and across the region. So um, we're very proactive as a government. And, uh, and I think the second airport at Badgeries provides huge opportunities for us to build on what we've done. But also, I don't want to underestimate this, um, we're not perfect. We don't always get everything right 100% of the time. I'm the first to admit that. But what we have done successfully is provide a very certain operating environment in New South Wales. So business has confidence that when we say we're going to do something within a certain time frame, they have then confidence to invest in that. And I, don't, I think that speaks volumes for encouraging that two-way investment flow and, um, and more of it. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Great to hear that state rivalry as well. <laughs> or um, lack I've, of, really. <laughs> or lack of. <laughs> I've been told we actually do have time for one more question. So is there any... any there's some, I can't see this one over there. Great. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan Cartledge from the Green Building Council of Australia. It's been great to see the New South Wales government commit to net zero emissions by 2050. And you spoke about working horizontally, effectively horizontally across all aspects of government. I'm just wondering how ambitious you think the government needs to be in committing to incremental targets across government to meet that commitment. I think incremental targets um, in the main, in the main incremental targets work very well. Um, but it depends on the target that you've set. So some things require a jump all at the one time. For example, we exceeded our jobs target. We, we, we'd set ourselves a jobs target over a four-year period and we matched or we exceeded in two and a half years' time. So in that case, we actually bumped it up and then met the target again. So generally speaking, depending on what the target is, incremental targets do matter. Um, but sometimes um, you're better off having an aspirational target because changes in technology and changes in the operating environment might cause a jump all at once in something. So I don't like to have a general blanket position on that. I think what works, and this is another thing I've learned in public life, is you can't be so general in a policy that it, uh, that it um, disallows you to really buckle down to the root cause of something or, or look at how the, where the opportunities are. So I think you need to set targets, whether they're aspirational or whether they're incremental based on what you're measuring. Some things are easier to measure than others. Uh, how do you measure quality of life? How do you measure um, the best, best health service? You can. You can measure that in time. For example, the time it takes to provide something for the citizen. And obviously people think... The shorter time period you have to provide someone with a service is a tick, but what's the quality? 
So um, even with our major projects and even with our services, we make sure our targets aren't just numeric, but they're also quality-based. So you want to make sure what you're providing has good quality and high standards. So um, that's probably a very generic way of answering your question. But yes, uh, I believe very much in targets, but it depends on what you're measuring as to how you measure that target and how you, how you get to that goal. Fabulous. Well, I might close out uh, at this point. Um, Premier, thank you so much for uh, your wonderful address and also sharing with us both the progress but also your vision for the future. I think that's been great to hear and a great way of closing out uh, today. I think for me, and certainly someone relatively new into my role at First State Super, and as I've gone around and spoken to many, as you know, we serve teachers, nurses, police officers, um, it's fantastic to hear your focus there and putting on the additional um, roles as well as focus on infrastructure, but all with a sense of real accountability uh, and getting the job done. So congratulations. Uh, please join me in thanking the Premier of New South Wales on behalf of CEDA. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.